Today's message is entitled, God is Holy. Look with me in our, our first passage of Scripture, Psalm 29, verse 2. The psalmist writes to us and says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. It seems to me that there are some of us, maybe all of us, who at times will give off a, a mistaken idea of splendor. I suppose since the dawn of Christendom, the first buildings dedicated as places of worship, humans have been missing the splendor of God. Look at that slide, Martin. There you see one of, one of the most iconic cathedrals in all the world, Notre Dame and the Flying Buttresses. What a powerful statement of splendor and glory. I haven't ever walked through those halls and corridors. I can imagine the awe that it inspires just from the photographs and the descriptions. And then there are those cathedrals that have the stained glass windows throughout. And we're, we're trying to approximate the splendor and the majesty and the glory of God. There's nothing wrong with architecture. There's nothing wrong with stained glass. There's nothing wrong with having a beautiful flower adorning the sanctuary. God has given us a sense of artistic appreciation. But our feeble attempts and our most extravagant tries do not reflect the glory that is God. Do not re reflect the splendor of His holiness. For God's splendor is of a whole other dimension. A different kind of splendor, a different level of splendor, a different something. First Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 says, Because just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. God is holy. There are three things I'd like to give you today about the holiness of God. First, God is the standard for holy. God does not simply set the standard for holiness. He is the standard. He does not simply act holy. He does not measure up to the standard of holiness. Holiness is the standard because that is is who He is. That is His nature. Number two, God is always holy. God is not holy sometimes and unholy others. We might think if God were like us, that would be the case. But God is not like us. We are to be like Him. He's not holy in the morning and unholy in the night. And you must understand that with God there is no darkness. There is no night. Because He Himself is light. And in Him there is no darkness at all. God is always. But not only is God always holy, but God is completely holy. God is holy on the inside and the outside. Amen. All of God's actions and interactions with His creation 
the angels in heaven, and even his judgment on evil is holy. And anyone who accuses God of unholiness doesn't know God is the standard. He cannot be unholy. God doesn't simply act holy. He thinks unholy. You, you ever have those little thoughts in your head when somebody gets on your nerves and you're acting holy. But inside, you're thinking something else. See, God doesn't have that problem. God does and thinks all the time holy. His actions and His attitudes are always holy all the time. Now, we go back to this, this passage in, in Peter. It says, be holy because I am holy. So what is our holiness? We could spend all day talking and exploring the holiness of God and never fully understand the wet and the breadth, breadth of His holiness. We can examine each revelation which is given to us and explore the heights and the depths of His holiness and we would never get to an understanding. We can only know as much as He has revealed to us. You remember when He, when he allowed Moses to see His glory on the mountain? He had to put His hand over Moses' over the cleft in the rock. And Moses saw the glowing because it was too much. Moses to take in. There is so much more to God than we could ever know or understand or fathom. Though we could spend our entire lives studying Him and the little bit of revelation that He has given to us. And yet we are not simply to study Him. We are also to experience and if we desire to experience God, we must be like Him. Holy. Though no, holiness is not something we can attain on our own, God willingly grants us holiness. He imparts His holiness to us when we, we become Christians. We are born spiritually and we inherit His nature. How wonderful is that? Amen. We inherit the nature of God and we've just said the nature of God is holiness. This is often called positional holiness. We are holy because God lifts us out of our miry pit and places us, cleanses us, lifts us into a place, a position of holiness. <clears throat> because of His work, we are holy. And yet Scripture encourages us to put forth effort. To strive to improve and maintain holiness. Positional holiness is who we are. But this maintenance of holiness is what we do. This is essentially us fighting against the sin that so could so easily beset us. It's fighting against the influence of our fleshly nature inherited from Adam. It's us choosing to resist temptations when they come. And to honor the name and the power of God who has given us this positional standing that we maintain and that we walk in. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 says, Make every effort, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. But without holy. No one will see the Lord. Make effort, the Bible says. 
This is not positional holiness. It is our continual desire to labor and maintain the standard to which He has placed us. But this is not salvation by works. It is works of salvation. It's not what we do to earn salvation. It is what we do because we have received the gift of salvation. Amen. We walk and talk and think and pursue holiness. God is as goodness, and we have a need for that. As we contemplate worship and entering into the presence of a holy God, we come back to Isaiah's revelation that we had last week in chapter 6. He said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. When we enter into the presence of God, who is so thoroughly holy, we are struck quite often by our faults and our failures and our own. And there are many people in this world who contemplate the holiness of God and then they shrink away from entering into His presence because they feel so unworthy. They rightly feel that their sin and their imperfection and their unholiness will be found out. And they're correct. What they fail to understand is that the blood of Jesus is a covering for all of our failures and imperfections and our unholiness. It cleanses us and covers us. The writer to the Hebrews tells us in chapter 4 that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword it penetrates, I like that, I like that word, it penetrates, even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Be careful now. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. The Word of God penetrates. It judges our thoughts, our attitudes, as well as our heart. And when it tells us that nothing in all of creation is hidden from Him, that means us. God understands you. God gets you. God reaches into you and understands your thoughts and your motivations and your attitudes. You know, we're, we're almost... We're almost by nature wanting to do what Adam and Eve did when they had sinned, cover up. We want to put our best foot forward. And we most often should. We come into the house of God, we want to, we want to look good. Even when we may not be. Sometimes we try to cover our imperfections with window dressings. We fall into the sin of the Pharisees. Jesus said to the Pharisees that they were whitewashed tombs. They looked good on the outside, but on the inside there was death and decay and a foul stench in the nostrils of God. Oftentimes we try to cover up our unholiness. Our greatest problem maybe is that we can fool the people around us. 
You know, the people around us, they see us in certain circumstances and not always because we can't penetrate everything and uncover everything. And so we can fool the people around us. And when we begin to fool the people around us, and they begin to put such a wonderful estimation of who we are, we might even get fooled ourselves. We can make others believe that we are good, moral, decent individuals. Maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons why we defaulted to wearing our Sunday best. Dressing up for church. Because we want to look as good as we can. I kind of like dressing down the church and being real. At least then we know who we are. We want to look like we have it all together. On the outside we're spick and span, but on the inside we're a torrent. There's a storm brewing within us. We're decaying and our hearts are filled with anger and unforgiveness and death. And though we look good on the outside, we're fearful and we're lonely and we're hurting and we're afraid to admit our weakness. But God knows. God understands our feeble attempts to cover up. Listen, when he called out to Adam and Eve in the garden and asked where they were, he wasn't really asking where they were. He knew where they were. Scripture says, his word penetrates. His word separates. He will not permit to enter into his presence us if we try and carry with us improper attitudes. He will not allow us into His presence without His covering of holiness. Some of us, though, cling to our unholiness. Some of us long for healing and wholeness, and yet we cling to our unholiness. On more than one occasion, I've counseled with individuals to come to understand that the reason they didn't have peace with God was because there was some sin in their life. They knew it. They recognized it. They verbalized it. They admitted it. And they went away like the rich young ruler. Sad. Because they had grown so fond. They didn't want to turn loose. Sin was in their life and in their heart. And when they knew the blockage, they left sad because they would not. Not that they could not, but they would not turn away. There's an old song. Some of you may know. It says, sin can never enter there. And please don't try to fool God. Please don't spend so much effort trying to fool others that you wind up fooling yourself. Holiness is God's standard. And yet I don't want to leave you there because I want you to know God has made a way for us to enter into His presence. For us to be holy. To live holy. God has made a way for he has told us that if we would repent from our sin, repent from our unholy actions, and repentance means to turn away, not to walk alongside of, not to, to get as close as we can without doing it, but to turn away from 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Turn away from our unholy attitudes, to confess them to Him and ask Him to come and help us when those old ways of thinking and those old thoughts come back to <coughs> us to, to say, God, that's just the devil tempting me. I don't want to be there anymore. Amen. Scripture says He's gracious and forgiving. 
And He will cleanse us from all sin. 1 John. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we've been cleansed from all unrighteousness, we are holy. He will purify us. His power can heal our hurts. It can cleanse the deepest reaches of our hearts because the Word of God penetrates down to the dividing of joints and marrow, to soul and spirit. And then, we can worship the Lord as the psalmist encouraged us in the beauty of His holiness. We're purified. We're cleansed. We're inside and out, up and down, over and under, made righteous. Think about how wonderful God is. Though He cannot permit us to come in with our sin, He will meet us outside and wash us. You know, in the temple that... Moses was given the pattern for there was the labor outside, the, wet, the washing basin. It was a symbol of the fact that before we can come into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, there was a washing that takes place. But God meets us there and washes us because we cannot do it ourselves. And understand, when God washes you, he doesn't forget to do behind your ears. He washes you through and through. He doesn't miss any nooks or crannies. He cleans around the baseboards of your home. He cleans in the back of your teeth and in between. He cleanses you. I offer you an invitation. If you've been trying to fake it, if you've been putting on a holy face or beautiful clothes trying to hide the sin and the depravity that is inside of you, I want you to understand God already knows. And the righteous penalty for your sin is death. You deserve it. But God is holy. He will execute His judgment. But He is willing and He is able to forgive us from our sin. All that He asks is that we believe in the sacrifice that Jesus has made. And that we confess our improprieties and our improper attitudes and that we turn away from sin. You see, it's impossible for us to travel in two directions at one time. We cannot continue on the course of sin and travel toward God at the same time. It's not possible. So then let us put aside the sin that so easily besets us and run with endurance the race that is marked out before us. Let us 